Welcome, Kelly. I'm so th excited that you're here today and talking yeah. about this subject that I feel like um, is so important and I want pretty much every woman to know about it because I know um, that it's, you know, helped me and helped some clients and that is um, yoni steaming or vaginal steaming. I, what do you tend to call it? Um, I go with vaginal steaming just because yoni is a word that's kind of new to me mm. and also because um, I uh, find that vaginal steaming is most used so that's what people are most like searching for on YouTube Google and Instagram and so that's actually why I use that term just so people can find it yeah that makes total sense I love that so tell us what it is for people that have never heard of it before or have you know misunderstood what it is okay so vaginal steaming <laughs> You're going to get a pot, okay? A pot is always involved, some type of a container. Mm -hmm. And then there's gonna be water involved. And there is, are probably also gonna be herbs, okay? And just like normal, you would uh, boil this water and get it to a nice steam, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if there's herbs in it, then you have to let it you know, simmer for probably like five, 10 minutes until the herbs you know, release their color and their smell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get some nice steam going. Mm -hmm. And then you, there's different variations. The, the most rustic variation is that you can put it on the ground, on a clean area, mm -hmm. um, over a towel or something, and then you can kneel over it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, bottomless, so that the steam touches the vagina, that it will arise and touch the vagina. Now, um, we call it a vaginal steam, but the steam is touching more than just the vagina. It's touching the vulva, mm -hmm. it's touching the clitoris, it's touching the anus, it's touching the whole entire perennial area. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I actually, uh, I think a more, um, a more correct term for vaginal steaming is, uh, per perennial steaming. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, again, I don't go around calling it perennial steaming because nobody is looking for it. <laughs> They'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then the shorter version of perennial steaming, I say peristeaming, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's that entire oh, okay. area between the legs. And actually, um, historically, it wasn't just used for women. Um, in different parts of the world, it's actually used for men as well. So it's oh, actually okay. a treatment for men in Korea and China. Um, that actually doesn't surprise me, you know, I feel yeah. like uh, some other cultures have sort of, yeah, just understood uh, taking care of our bodies in a different way than we have, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, when Western medicine, when when modern, what we have is modern gynecology came and things changed. You know, yeah. we went to the, we went to surgery. Yeah. We went to pharmaceuticals, you know, and those are the main things that we see, you know, at the mm -hmm. hospital and, and with gynecologists. Um, but so then, um, then a better way to steam is if you have like a special steam sauna or a throne or some type of a special queen's chair, you know, this goes by different, by different terms. So what you could do, um, what you will see will be like something that looks like, like a wooden trunk mm -hmm. that will have, um, the where you can put the pot inside of it. Mm -hmm. And then on top of the wooden trunk, instead of it just being a closed lid, it'll be a closed lid, but with a hole in it. So mm -hmm. you can sit there. Mm -hmm. That makes it a lot more comfortable than if you're um, kneeling over it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also see people will do stools. So they'll create stools that sit the same idea. It'll just be look like a normal stool, but there will be space for the pot under it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there will be a hole in it so that you can sit there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, sometimes people use like birthing chairs. I find birthing chairs are a little bit too low, but if you imagine like a birthing chair, but higher for those in the birth community that are familiar with those. Um, sometimes it'll look like that. And then also people will use like a geriatric chair um, you know, the old people use when they need yeah. to sit, you know, to use the Power restroom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or if somebody's injured and they need something like that. So you could use anything that has a hole in it. And then um, sometimes people get creative and they'll use like um, those like vintage like commodes that, that, <laughs> that people used to use um, inside the house that would have like, it's like basically it's like a nice wooden chair. Okay. Um, but you use it as a toilet, you know, right. it has like a bucket or a pot and that is used as a right. toilet. You know? so, um, so those can be used. So you need a chair or a seat with a hole yeah. in it to sit and be comfortable when you're doing it. I, and that's I've what seen, that is. That's crazy. I love all the different ways that it can be done. I've even seen, um, I think things on Amazon that you can put in your toilet. 
like the idea is even, oh. even though I would think that would be too close right like if you just put something in your toilet and the steam comes up that might be a little a little closer than it should be <laughs> mm. yeah. you can do it you can yeah. do it people do toilet steams yeah my problem is like my problem is that I'm, I'm I, I just um, what I see sometimes people doing is they'll use like a plastic, um, sits bath and they'll put it in the toilet. So I don't recommend using plastic. Right. I don't think you can put like, you know, steaming. If the water's hot enough for it to be steaming, it shouldn't be in plastic. Plastic, right. right. Cause you get all those um, fun xenoestrogens along with your right? good herbs, right? Yeah. We don't want to, we don't want to um, put the toxins in there. And then the other issue I have with the toilet is that I don't, there's like a hygiene issue, you know? Right. Right. So, so I don't necessarily recommend the toilet. And then also one really important thing about the vaginal steaming, it shouldn't be too hot. It actually, it should feel nice and warm um, and comfy. So I kind of um, compare it to like a shower. Like you can take a, a shower with the temperature too hot mm -hmm. or you can take a cold shower, but you're still going to get clean. Right. Right. right, <laughs> so, right yeah. Same, you know, if the if the shower is too hot, we're trained to actually turn it down to a temperature that's comfortable. Right. So that's how it is with the steam. But steam doesn't have like the knob that you can adjust it right away. So if it's too hot, you have to wait a little bit until it gets to that comfortable temperature. But the steam is going to be the same, no yeah. matter what. Yeah you don't have to have it scalding hot. And so I think one thing that has happened with the strand is people have learned about it. You know, they've heard the stars talking about it, maybe seen it on TV, gone to YouTube, put a plastic sits, you know, bath in their <laughs> sits bowl in their toilet and scalded themselves, you know? And that's where, you know, like, it's just like, you know, that's not, that's not how it's supposed to be done. This isn't something that's supposed to be uncomfortable. Right, you're like, that's where the issues can arise. <laughs> Out, yeah. So what are the herbs doing when, when they're in there? Like, what, how is that supporting your system? Okay, so, um, so herbs have different properties. And so it would depend on which herbs are being used. Um, but the reason why, like, so the way that I use my herbs, for example, um, is that I notice that people with short menstrual cycles, um, I want to, I want to lengthen their menstrual cycles to like a 28, 29 days. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people, um, that can help like get the ovulation timing at that 14, 15 days. And this is something that's very useful when people are trying to conceive for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then also some people just bleed too much. I mean, they bleed every 14 days and it's just not necessary. Right. <laughs> okay? like, yeah. it's too much. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so when you, when I want to lengthen a menstrual cycle and I'll see that somebody's bleeding too much or they have bleeding issues, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use herbs with the uh, anti-hemorrhagic properties mm. that stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And then I'm also going to use, there's another issue when people are bleeding too much that, um, that their uterus is tired, the uterus is fatigued. Mm -hmm. fatigued. So I'm also going to use uh, uterine tonics mm -hmm. that help to um, actually strengthen the uterus. Okay. So those are the properties of the herbs that I'm going to use for that menstrual cycle. So why I'm walking you through this like this is because um, again, when you just go to YouTube or Google, it kind of seems like all herbs are the same. And that's what a lot of times people are just, you know, doing it yourself. They heard a list of herbs and grabbing something from their, you know, cabinet. It's actually important that you're understanding what the menstrual cycle is and then what the properties of the herbs are. On the other hand, there's people that just never get their menstrual cycle. I had this one woman, she was like, I'm 35 and I've had my period three times. <laughs> Like, like three times in her ago. life whoa once when i was like 25 and once when i was like 31 i was like oh my gosh okay so she's not getting her cycles right wow. and then more more commonly um i hear people who will say yeah i get my period three or four times a year right, right. so people are getting their periods every three months or something like that this is a completely different cycle wow. well in with this cycle what we actually want to do is give somebody herbs that are going to help uh to increase their circulation. So cycles can get um, delayed because they have a circulation issue okay. and also because there's not enough blood. So these people might be like, you know, have anemia or some type of blood right. deficiency like that, right. that tendency. So in that case, I want to give people circulatory herbs and blood tonics, mm -hmm. you know, so, and, and that helps to um, get the periods to come more regularly. Gotcha. So, you know, so anyway, so the herbs aren't like one size fits all. So what I recommend is um, that people work with a practitioner and actually, you know, just the same as like 
you don't go to the pharmacy. You know, they have the they have all the pharmaceuticals in the back. You know, you're not you can't just go and pick whichever one. You know, so it's it's important to work with a practitioner. I would say any herbalist, but the thing is that um, that herbalists aren't trained to analyze the menstrual cycle. Mm-hmm. So I train practitioners to be able to analyze the menstrual cycle and to tailor the herbal properties and the formulas based on the menstrual cycle. So I, I recommend working with a certified um, practitioner. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an important point. I'm glad that you brought it up. I think with hormone stuff in general, you know, there's, I love um, empowering women and, you know, and teaching them as much as I can about what's going on. But at the yeah. same time, you know, it is so specific to what their body is going through, right? And we need to, right. need to figure that out and not just because you can make things worse. If you start supplementing with certain things, you know, you start doing these certain foods and that doesn't work for your cycle. So same That's idea. Right. Herbs. herbs are powerful and people don't always recognize that, I think. Yeah. 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 Pharmaceuticals are based on herbs, yeah. you know, they, they, oh, this herb has this property and then they extract it and figure out a way to turn it into a pharmaceutical. That's fine. Yeah. But, you know, again, the herb has that actual property, you know, yeah, so we can't absolutely. treat all herbs like they're the same. Yeah. So uh, I, as you were kind of explaining some of the different um, things that you focus on, I was thinking about like, you know, with say fibroids, because I've dealt with that myself and ovarian cysts and stuff. Is that kind of along the same lines as um, maybe when you bleed too much? I mean, often with fibroids, I guess the, you know, excessive bleeding happens. Yeah, it can. It can for some. And then also some people with fibroids are post-menopause. Right. Some people with fibroids have missing periods. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it manifests in different ways. And so that's why, so fibroids, I wish that I could because fibroids is one of the main reasons why people seek out vaginal steaming. I wish that I could just say one herb and that's going to be true for everybody, but it isn't. It depends on the menstrual cycle. It depends on what's going on and what imbalances the woman has. So fibroids, fibroids tend to be, uh, so fibroids are a combination of um, uterine stagnation Mm -hmm. uh, and dampness, okay, Mm -hmm. at least as the way that I would classify it. And what I, I, um, I create, I created a way to read the period where I look at, I'm looking for, uh, the, the menstrual cycle imbalances. So there's seven menstrual cycle imbalances I've identified okay. and I'm using this. Um, I'm basically using traditional Chinese medicine okay. as if That's what I was gonna ask. Menstrual cycle imbalances. Yeah. Because I was just fascinated that when I went to the gynecologist, um, I, I remember them asking, do you have any questions? Like my first visit. And I was just like, mm, is my blood supposed to be brown? And they were like, oh, it's brown. And I was like, yes, did I say something? <laughs> and then they were like, is it always brown? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, yeah, that's fine. That's oh. just what's normal for you. Right? right. Right. So then 10 years later, I wander into an acupuncture clinic and they were like, brown blood. They were like, okay, so that's a circulation issue. Mm. And I was like, what? <laughs> they were like, yeah, you have liver chi stagnation. That's why you have brown blood <laughs> even more so. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> like, what? You know, like it didn't seem right. That's why I asked about it. Now for 10 years, I've been under the, you know, like belief that, you know, it's this just, is normal for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. So then I started to read more about it. And I realized that in traditional Chinese medicine, they can read the blood. They read the mm-hmm. blood and they read what that means about what your organs are doing mm-hmm. in that way. Um, it ends up being you're treating pro- uh, you're treating something before it actually becomes a problem, rather than letting it become a problem. Mm-hmm. So the problem with traditional Chinese medicine is that it is in Chinese and in terms that I you know it took me a long time to you know and re- a lot of reading to to learn to understand. So I um, I created this way of you know kind of talking about it and explaining it to people which I call the seven menstrual cycle imbalances and then I created so instead of saying liver chi stagnation which it does originate in the liver I just say okay look there's uterine stagnation there's old residue in your uterus so we can understand what the effect of you know right. what the effect actual is is that that old that old that brown blood is blood from your previous cycle or right. from your previous 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 cycle right right it that can go way back blood. right yeah when it's yeah. brown like that yeah wow yeah so um when when they're doing vaginal steamings you know to say in this case like to to deal with brown blood issues is that something that you would also say, okay, there's some other herbs you'd want to take internally to support your liver or 
Or do you want to just focus on just the steaming aspect of it? And, and I think everybody should be doing vaginal steaming and acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Those two together can really, you know, so like acupuncture is really good at treating the, the liver to get right. it healthy, for example, right. and to get it functioning like it's supposed to. But it takes a lot longer to clear out that old residue that built up in the uterus. Okay, yeah. that can take a long time for that to clear out once the, the organ is, is functioning the way it's supposed to. Right. But when you put these two together, you can see that when people steam, sometimes that brown blood is just completely gone and they don't see it again. Right. So whereas with acupuncture, it may have taken, you know, a again, the liver functioning right, but now it takes the body a while to work it out. So vaginal steaming can really assist, at, especially with uterine stagnation, getting that old stuff clear pretty quickly uh, yeah and how often you know do you recommend and i'm sure it depends on obviously what's going on with a particular woman but like how often and then what parts of your cycle i think that's kind mm -hmm. of you know a, a, a lot of women don't understand that and they may try it on their period which i as far as i know you're not supposed to do and that kind of thing Okay, yeah, definitely. So let's not steam during the period because the, as the blood is as the blood is coming out, um, one misconception is that the blood is coming from the uterus. The blood is coming from your heart. Mm -hmm. There's a vein that goes, an artery that goes right from your heart right to your uterus. Okay, mm -hmm. your entire channels are open, so you wouldn't want to steam at that time because you're going to pull more of your blood out. You know, you could. Right, what does heat do? It increases the speed of water. Well, blood is made up mostly of water. So you don't want to speed up your blood and start bleeding. Right. Okay? So that's the danger of steaming during your period. Gotcha. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I've thought through it. Okay. Um, then you have, um, then I actually recommend steaming once a week. I love steaming once mm, a week. As okay. as I think that is one of the best things that somebody could do because the menstrual cycle at least a healthy menstrual cycle um, is, is going to have four phases, right? And those four phases are going to last about a week. Mm -hmm. So if somebody steams weekly, they're hitting all four phases of the mm -hmm. menstrual cycle. And one of the things, one of the effects of steaming and, uh, weekly is that people will say, well, what about mine? You know, my luteal phase is shorter or my, you know, ovulation phase is longer or whatever it is. Right steam weekly <laughs> and it just kind of puts things back into timing it just helps like it no of course the body is designed to do everything you know perfectly mm -hmm. however uh sometimes things don't happen the way that they're expected or the way that they're supposed to you know sometimes there's there's problems and sometimes you know like a fibroid fibroid that's a that's a uterine disorder like it's not supposed to happen right but they do happen right so the same with the cycle and the timing and the different phases they can be all over the place mm -hmm. but steaming weekly helps to like what it does is it brings circulation to the uterus and bringing circulation to the uterus lets the uterus helps or assist the uterus to do whatever it it right. Do its job. So yes. this, this is helpful for people, whether or not they have a healthy cycle or if they don't, it just gives it like a boost. It's just mm -hmm. kind of like taking a spirulina shot in the morning. I mean, right. it's just going to be better for you. Like, right. you know, it's just going to help your body have more, you know, like nutrients to do what it needs to do for the day. Right. Like, mm -hmm. so, um, so that's kind of like what doing that weekly steaming is. And I recommend that for everybody. And then also, as you said, um, when treating specific things, I, I, there are like practitioners are trained to do different steam plans with people, mm -hmm. but you have to be careful because, um, and, it, and it is important to work with a practitioner if you're trying to address something very specific. And I'll give an example, miscarriage. Okay. Mm. Mis vaginal steaming is really great for recovering from miscarriage. However, it's really important to follow exactly what happens because sometimes people say I miscarried and they start to steam and then they start to contract and then they the fetus comes out okay so oh. you know at that point you want to stop steaming right. then you know once the fetus comes out they may be fresh bleeding so then it may be okay well let's wait for three days you know right. or however long until that goes away until the blood turns brown again and you know that you're not fresh bleeding then you start again so it's reactive right. the steaming has shown that it is really effective at doing stuff it's an effective therapy and in that way you have to watch it closely and 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 you have to also consider what the situation is and what the effect might be right, right. so the same with steaming for infections uh, if somebody has infections um first of all there's different kinds of infections so you have to determine which kinds and then 
when they start steaming, it's interesting. Like this one lady, she was like, okay, I'm on day four of steaming. She's had a uh, chronic BV for like 10 years. Mm-hmm. She's like, and she's like, have you seen the movie Slimer? <laughs> the movie <laughs> Ghostbusters? I was like, yeah, sorry. She goes, Slimer just came out at me. She's like, I've never seen anything <laughs> like it. It was a huge green gob monster. She's like, I've never, I was like, have you even ever seen green before? She's like, no. I was like, okay, good. Yeah. Good. It's <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes people will want to steam for, you know, so she, she steamed and then after that she had no discharge. So it was like, okay, so she steamed for six days in a row. She got all of the discharge out. She got Slimer out right. and she has a, she's been BV free ever since. Right. Wow. So, you know, you have to react to what's going on. We don't necessarily need her to steam every day, you know, for 15 days if she's already got the Slimer out, you know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> it's very responsive. You know, right. it's very responsive. So in that way, it is useful to work with a practitioner if you're trying to solve something in particular. Right. Which a lot of women definitely are. You know, they have um, some stuff going on for sure. So when you mentioned before about, uh, you know, once a week um, for the four weeks, would you use, like, depending on what's going on, you know, in terms of your period, but would you use the same herbs for every week or would it be different depending on where you are in your cycle? Um usually once you determine somebody's imbalance Mm -hmm. uh usually those herbs are always gonna be gotcha be the same but there there can be variation yeah 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 oh my goodness (laughs) there's just so it's i mean it doesn't surprise me at all that you know there's so much depth to it but i think as you said a lot of people just kind of do this reading and they're like sweet i'll just throw some like some lavender and rosemary in there and we'll be good to go right yeah yeah it's not um It's not that simple for sure. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about sort of the history behind steaming? Sure, I'll tell you what I know. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you what I know. So um, vaginal steaming, um, the first time I heard about it, I heard it from Marcia Lopez, who is a Mayan abdominal womb healer who studied under Dr. Rosita Arvigo, okay? Um, And she learned about it in Guatemala. So, I was like, okay, vaginal steam is from Guatemala, okay? Um, and so that's all I knew about it, okay? But a couple of years later, I talked to a Ghanaian woman, a woman from Ghana and a woman from Haiti, who were both like, oh yeah, vaginal steam is from my country, we do it. And I was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> right. I have a master's degree in international development, so I like international topics. And I was just like, noted, you know, they're saying it's from there. Yeah. Then I was looking online to learn more about vaginal steaming and I found, I found that it was done at Korean spas. So I'm like, did they learn it from the Guatemalans? Like, (laughs) yeah. And so I've continued to like pay attention to where people are saying vaginal steaming is from. And I learned whatever I can, if possible, like what herbs are being used and what it's being used for. And I've actually compiled all of this information into one place on the Vaginal Steam World Map, which is available on the Steamatrix website. And I include whatever information that I can about um, how vaginal steaming is used in different places. And um, to date, I have found, I think, over 50 different countries where vaginal steaming is from and so or, or used. And now some of the references like in south korea vaginal steaming is like the thing to do it's like going and getting mani and pedis like it's just everybody does it there are steam saunas everywhere it's not news like nobody would be listening to this interview they would be like they would be listening to this interview confused about why i'm explaining what vaginal steaming is this would be like explaining what brushing your teeth is like right why do you brush your hair like that's what this would be like for them okay so some places it's commonplace um, and then most places, especially European places and descendant of European places, so U.S., um, Australia, Canada, we have no idea what this is. We're like, what? Like, what? <laughs> right? Yeah. But I even have found that, um, that there are, is record of vaginal steaming here among the native populations. But then um, there's, so then it was like, okay, cool. But Europe was the absolute last place that I found vaginal steaming. And now I've found so many references to it. But there's different terms that are used, and you, what you have to look for is the term fumigation. So, for fumigation. example, yes, girl, <laughs> in England, in England, <laughs> vaginal steaming was a thing. Okay, every like it was known. Okay, it was known as smelly womb fumigation. Oh my god! Okay. 
So, you know, put that into your, you know, search bar, you know, then you're going to find some stuff. Oh, I right? will be. I'm like, I'm going to be Googling that later. Wow. So, and then, um, and then um, one of my uh, French students sent me um, a reference. She found it in an old French book. Wow. Um, she, you know, up in the mountains, she said one of the herbalists, you know, was learning, you know, some of the different remedies used in different villages and the women's remedies were used uh, with steaming. And so she found this reference in this book from the 1700s. So she sent me um, a picture of the book. The title of the book is this old French book, as well as the, uh, the reference in the book to vaginal steaming. So you can, you can look at this yourself on the vaginal steam world map. Um, so we found that it's in uh, Spain. It's in, um, it's in Poland, it's in um, Germany. The midwives use it for labor preparation in Germany. So one of the really fascinating things about learning about the steaming in these different places is it was used for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So, But when you look at and you put the list of all the different reasons that vaginal steaming was used, what we find is every reason why women go to the gynecologist. Right. Traditionally, women have been using vaginal steaming. Yeah. Wow. And so that's that's what and, I know. You know, thank you for sharing that. And it, it doesn't surprise me at all because there's so much, you know, I think that traditionally we understood um, and, and used for probably thousands of years that we no longer do now, or it's sort of an underground thing or an alternative thing, you know, and obviously we're in a place of kind of rediscovering some of these things yeah. now in America, you know, but but, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where you're like, of course, like, it, of course, it makes sense. And it, it's probably, you know, was intuitive in a lot of senses, along with being passed down generationally, you know, and it's just like, somewhere along the way, when we're suppressing women and their health and all those things, it gets lost, you know, or, or it gets shoved under something and, and then we discover it later, you know. Oh, it's, yeah, so incredible to me. So I'm so excited to check out this map on your website. I think that's so cool. Thank you for doing that and putting that together. Yeah, yeah it's so cool. The most information that I found was um, this one book uh, called The Trotula. And it was this first, like, it was this uh, female physician in Italy in the 1200s or 1100s, somewhere around there. And, like, every page in the book is talking about vaginal steaming. Like, there's... <laughs> It's just incredible. It's like, this is how it is done. <laughs> this is how you take cover, it. The cover of the book is a picture of them holding the women, <laughs> a woman <laughs> over a pot steaming. I was like, wait a minute. And the funny thing is, is like, so unless you, unless we know vaginal steaming and are thinking about it, you kind of miss it. You know? Right, of course. <laughs> You're like, why oh. is she like hanging over the pot? Why are they holding her there? Yeah. Wow, mm. that's so cool. So how did you find yourself in the world of vaginal steaming <laughs> and and entrenched in it you know <laughs> when i was a little girl i i just remembered what i want to be when i grow up is a vaginal steam <laughs> <laughs> i mean it didn't happen like that let's just right. say i can imagine uh, just you know you know christine women have problems mm -hmm. women have problems and when you work out your own problems which was happened with, what happened with me mm -hmm. then you share that with others, you know, and that's basically what happened. So there was two things. Number one, I got rid of a missing period. I actually, I wasn't interested in steaming when I first heard about it. I was just like, weird. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay. weird. Um, yeah, but then my period was missing and it was a problem. Like my hormones were out of control. And mm -hmm. so I found a Korean spa, I did a vaginal steam and within 24 hours, honestly, within six hours, my period had come back. Wow. after months of being gone so that was helpful but that wasn't enough for me to share it with other people i actually told nobody like i was like this is something i keep to myself yeah yeah so, i wasn't ready yet so then um so then when i had my baby when i had my first baby um i used the steaming afterwards and i believe that the steaming um did a couple of things number one it helped me uh with i had all this swollen skin I had a stage three prolapse, my uterus was falling down and out, and I had, um, what was the third thing I was gonna say? Um, oh, when I was pregnant, they were like, yeah, you have three fibroids, they're real small, but we'll just wait and watch them. I was like, no, that, no, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> 
Uh, and we'll surgically remove them. That's the only option. Yeah. Well, so I went to the acupuncturist and I was like, hey, can you do something about these fibroids? And they were like, not while you're pregnant, but after you're pregnant, come back. Anyways, when I went, after I had my baby and I was, you know, back to things and I went and I got an ultrasound to see what, what was going on with these fibroids. I didn't have any fibroids. Mm. So I did the steaming postpartum. I didn't have fibroids. My, my prolapse uh, corrected itself. Oh, I, I thought it did, you know, and the swollen skin went down. This is a very different experience than now, you know, once you become a mom, other people share with you what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. I came to find out there were people who had prolapse. That's something that can happen. Yeah. Um, but it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago, but they still had prolapse ever since this one childbirth and they've had it ever since. And I'm like, oh my God. No, that's you know, the life that they live, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah exactly. And so long story short, at the end of the day, I started recommending it. Mm -hmm. And I would just tell people, yeah, just get a chair, you know, take off the seat, you know, just Jimmy rig something, yeah. you know, like I was just, I just thought like, <laughs> yeah, I hear you have done that too. <laughs> yeah. Like, cause that's what I did. Oh yeah. Basically I didn't like the spa experience because it was too social for me. Mm -hmm. So I decided, so I made my own chair at home. And so, um, I this one woman, she's like, I think that vaginal steaming could help me. She was crying over how bad her period was. And so I recommended it. She said, I think it can help me. She said, but I don't know what you're talking about, about making a chair. She said, can you just make one for me? Here's a hundred dollars. And so I was like, oh, interesting. Okay, I guess. I threw my baby in an ergo and I just made her a chair, right? The next week, three of her friends wanted chairs. I knew her, you know, and she had, you know, offered me. The next one, three of her friends were like, we'd like to buy ch chairs from you because she had really, she actually had a really transformative experience with her period. It changed dr drastically. Uh, hers was really heavy with a lot of clots. And now it went down to, it was, instead of being 10 days, it was only five days long and it was medium flow, no more flood bleeding. Yeah. So like her friends were like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> you know, they yeah, wanted the absolutely. food. And I didn't know these people. So then I was like this person in LA that people would pass my number around and then I would get a text message or a call with somebody crying and asking if I could make them if, or if they could buy a vaginal steam chair from me. And I was just like, so that's how my company grew. Like it started like that. And then one of those early on people wrote a blog about it. And the next thing I know, people would contact me from other states asking if I would make them a vaginal steam chair. This was in 2013. And this was pre Gwyneth Paltrow talking about vaginal steaming. And I was pretty confused as to why people wanted me to ship these vaginal steam chairs all over the country. But I, I was doing it to help women because yeah. women need help. I didn't actually know how much help women need, right. but this was my crash lesson on how much help women need because they were calling me and telling me these stories that were pretty horrific. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and vaginal steaming was helping them. Mm -hmm. And so, it just continued from there. And um, finally, after I was selling about 10 saunas, 10 chairs, then then they converted, I started making saunas so a little bit more like, you know, because it was not stopping, <laughs> you know, right, so I, right. I, You're like, yeah, I started making them better <laughs> rather than old chairs, you know? And so, um, so then uh, what I was gonna say is um, that, um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I lost my train of thought. Don't worry about it. So, well, you were saying in 2013, is, oh, yeah. What I noticed was that nobody else that I, I started to look if you can find vaginal steam chairs anywhere. There's nowhere in the there was nowhere in the United States where you can buy a vaginal steam chair or sauna. So I was the only that's why they were coming to you. Every yeah. And, and, so I, I, and by 2000, it was early 2015 in January of 2015. You know, you're looking at the, the year and I'm like, I'm selling all these chairs and I'm talking to people one by one. And now that I'm doing 10 per month, it's a lot of talking to people. I might as well put up a website and at least take a picture of what the chairs look like. Cause there was a lot of describing, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, put up my prices. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I put up steamychick.com in January, 2015 and um, uh, like probably like the first week of the year. Two weeks later, Gwyneth Paltrow talked about vaginal steaming uh -huh. on her website. Oh, wow. Look at that timing. <laughs> exactly. So I went viral. Yeah. Yeah, you did. As people started to look for it. Yeah. I was the only website, the only person making vaginal steam herbs and chairs. Wow. That's crazy. Talk about like your soul work, just like coming out and being like, bam, this is what, you, this is what you're meant to do. You have no choice, right? <laughs>
<laughs> Chasing me down. You will talk about periods publicly every day of your life. Oh God. Were, you, were you doing some other work? Um, I'm assuming before you got into all of this and that kind of like ended your ability to do anything else other than focus on this. Yeah. I, I, okay. So I have a master's degree in international development. So I did quite a bit of nonprofit work. Mm -hmm. And then I also, um, to make the real money, I worked as a tour, uh, a marketing manager wow. and, um, and yeah, it was really funny when, um, I got, I got called by one of my agencies and they were like, well, you do this tour. It was, um, it was a Verizon tour and I was just like, I can't. I was like, you don't even understand. I was like, you guys don't understand what's going on over here. I was like, but I've got like lumber everywhere. I was like, and I'm making some, you know, I couldn't tell them what I was making. And I was like, I have this, you know, little, uh, I used to call them, I used to tell people I'm making these trunks and they're like, you know, I have all these orders and I'm on back order and they couldn't believe that I turned down this tour because tours are really good money. But I was just like, I'm so sorry. I can't do it. Like <laughs> I was on back order. And so, yeah, I, I you know, yep. You're like, sorry, soul's calling. Got to do this thing every year. <laughs> the women need their saunas. <laughs> the, the, the vaginas needs to be steamed. Yeah, no doubt. Are there other people making them now? I'm yes. Yes. All, yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few people making them. So now there were there were they were always being made in Korea, um, and then there's different ways that they're made, like and used around the world um, and in different places. But um, but yeah, as far as a product, um, um, more people have started making them. And um, and what I do, I actually stopped making them and started to just um, I opened up a marketplace to feature the different saunas being made by different sauna makers. Oh. Saunas are beautiful; they're amazing, and you can just see a big variety of you know, how they're being made. And so I just feature them on my website. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop for getting your vaginal steam sauna. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the, um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, controversy, I guess, around vaginal steaming, particularly, you know, as we kind of talked about before we jumped into this interview with some OBGYNs, some more famous than others, that uh, decided to take on Gwyneth Paltrow and her, you know, love of vaginal steaming. And yeah, can you just kind of talk to, to that and sort of your, your take on that whole situation? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing that I want to clear up is that there are actually OBGYNs that are pro-vaginal steaming, okay? To the extent they've seen how beneficial it is that they have vaginal steaming done in-house in their OBGYN offices. So one of them that I wanted to call out is Dr. Lorena White, who is in Rockville, Maryland. And her website is the Evdemonia. No, her website is lorenawhite.com or something like that. So anyways, you can find her. She has a vaginal steam facilitator as part of her team. Okay? That's awesome. awesome. Another one is Dr. Tasha Rogers in Atlanta. Dr. Mm -hmm. Tasha Rogers says that she recommends it for every single one of her patients because she notices that a big difference when they're steaming and they're way healthier and they have way less bacterial infections, et cetera, et cetera, when her, when her patients are steaming versus mm -hmm. not steaming. So let's just, okay, first, yeah. first of all, you know, let's just say that. But the thing is that people don't know that. So I'm honestly, I'm going to write some blogs that feature these OBGYNs because yeah. the people in the media are not finding them. And that's not who they're calling when they ask, hey, Gwyneth Paltrow's vag steaming her vag. What do you think about it? Right? That's not who they're calling. Of course not, yeah. They're calling OBGYNs that are getting hit like like deers in the head, like what? <laughs> like I've never heard of that. Please don't do that, right? And so um, I was talking to Dr. Lorena White about it, and I said, "Well, why are OBGYNs if they don't know about it? Why are they saying not to do it?" And she said, "If they don't know about something, it is in their interest to recommend not to do it, or else they could be liable." Right. Right. So we have to understand what's going on here. If you ask an OBGYN, like, hey, uh, you know, should I be putting blueberries in my ear? If they've never heard about that. <laughs> like, no, no, please don't do that. Yeah. Why you would be doing it? They're going to say no, right. or else they're legally liable if right. you get hurt. Right. So that's why OBGYNs that don't know anything about it say not to do it. And so when you have to read the articles a little bit closer, because I'll tell you, by the time those, um, when Gwyneth Paltrow talked about vaginal steaming, all of a sudden there was a flurry of articles saying, oh, you do and say, don't do it. Gwyneth Paltrow says, do it. She's not a doctor, right? right. People who were steaming 
you know, at home and with all these results were calling me scared. I mean, one article said that you could possibly die if you vaginal steam. Okay. Well, you know, and so I had to read these articles a little bit closer and I was like, well, this guy who said that you could possibly die, he said, it's possible it might cause an embolism. He, he said that blowing air into the vagina could, mm -hmm. could cause somebody to die okay. because it could basically cause a rupture. Well, this is different than blowing air into the vagina. Yeah. Like, you know, like we're not, this is not that, right? right? He was describing something based on a journalist describing something to him mm. that isn't even what vaginal steaming is. Right. You know what I mean? right. So you kind of read the articles a little bit closer. Yeah. Um, but that said, there's a couple arguments. That one didn't like hold on. Like people didn't like, you know, like keep on saying yeah. that. People yeah, yeah. Died. Um, but there are a couple arguments that people have really held on to. So one of them is that steaming, and this is um, from uh, Dr. Jennifer Gunter. Um, she was one of the main people against um, Gwyneth Paltrow, and she, you know, is, is very public in the media about it. Um, so she, um, she, she said, I think it's possible that vaginal steaming could alter the pH balance of the right. vagina, which is very delicate. And so introducing any types of herbs or anything could could you know interrupt that and she said and it will cause like in her first article she said it will cause yeast infections mm. okay now she's changed her language a bit so that she doesn't claim that it will for mm. sure um but the thing is there are no there's so we listen to doctors and we have medical science because it's based on science mm -hmm. so science is based on experiments and testing and results Mm -hmm. But the reality is women don't report getting yeast infections from vaginal steaming. In fact, there are hundreds of women right now, thousands probably, who claim that vaginal steaming is helping them not get yeast infections anymore and helping their yeast infections clear up. Mm -hmm. And to see the stories that women have, um, I, I recently worked on a project where we um we collected me and my practitioners we collected a uh, hundred um testimonials of women about vaginal steaming why were you interested in vaginal steaming what was your problem that you had how would you rate the problem how did you use vaginal steaming and how is your problem now mm -hmm. and then they were able to describe what happened and there's now a hundred stories i have these also available on steamichick website um, it's called the pelvic steam testimonial database you, when you read these women's stories they're incredible and you'll see over and over again people say that they don't get yeast infections mm -hmm. anymore now that they've been doing the vaginal steaming mm -hmm. so what dr jennifer gunter says she is a doctor with a very important uh you know education to be able to speak on this matter however she's not a doctor who has any experience with vaginal steaming and what the effects of it are and that's something that's important to you know to recognize and if anybody wants to see how vaginal steaming is affecting women's vaginal flora go read their stories yeah. now reading people's stories those are testimonials that's not science okay right. and so that's what that's what somebody can come back and say and they're absolutely right so why don't the scientists study it? Yeah, that's the problem, right? And that, as you were talking about it, I was thinking about, you know, we have such a lack of science on women's health issues, right? There, I mean, we've, we've learned recently that, um, I think it was, you know, up until like 2012 maybe or something that they weren't even using women in most studies, right? Even on women's issues. Yeah, exactly. You know why? They were like, oh, women are different. Right. Women are they have different. hormones. It doesn't work the same on women, so we won't even test them. Right. So you now you've got all these drugs that are approved, all these pharmaceuticals that are approved to give to people where women have been locked in, and it's just assumed that it will work the same with them, even though the scientists themselves already said that it doesn't work the same on women. And that's, that's what we are prescribed. We're prescribed right. the medicine that works right. for men. And, 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 you know, piggybacking off of that, it's, it's always so frustrating to me when people will say, well, this hasn't been proven to be safe. Like, you know, vaginal steaming hasn't been proven to be safe. This other thing that was done for thousands of years by, you know, millions of people hasn't been proven to be safe. And I, like you said, it's like, well, let's do, let's do the research then. Let's actually do the research. The reason it hasn't been proven to be safe is because the research hasn't been done you know, are in our uh, 
approach, our scientific approach. Yes, from a Western point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the problem with the Western point of view, sorry, I actually wanted to say something about the proven to be safe before sure. I go there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it hasn't been proven to be unsafe either. Show right. me the person who died as a result of vaginal steaming. Right. Exactly. So that's why I'm like, okay, well, show me. Okay. He, I have a hundred women that are saying that, you know, oh, so sorry. I, I actually would have to go through to see how many have said that it improved their yeast infections. But I, I could, I tell you right now, I could collect probably thousands of stories on that because mm -hmm. I'm a steamy chick. I got a lot of people <laughs> following me <laughs> you mean? and yeah. telling me their stories. Okay. Yeah. I could probably find, I definitely could probably find a hundred people who say that steaming has improved their yeast infections. Yeah. Find me a hundred people that say otherwise, that steaming caused them to have yeast infections. We're not finding that. Mm -hmm. If we were, I wouldn't be selling people, you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't be educating people about this. Yeah. Women are talking about how it's changing their lives. Women who aren't able to have sex with their husbands because they have yeast infection after yeast infection or bacterial infection, and then they take the antibiotics, and then they and then after that they get the yeast infection, so they have to take the yeast infection, and then the second they have sex, they have this problem again, yeah. and that they're only able to have sex once a month because it takes two to three weeks to clear it up. I mean, like these are real things that women are dealing with. Read the stories. Yeah. And now because of vaginal steamy, they're not able to do that. So, anyways. I love science, I love doctors, I love a good medical opinion, but we need a good medical opinion. Yeah. So the good medical opinions are gonna be the medical opinions that doctors are giving based on what they know or mm -hmm. based on science, since we don't have that much science about vaginal steaming yet, which is another misnomer, like was actually an, another thing that's incorrect about this. We actually do have information about vaginal steaming and scientific studies, so I'll share about that uh, in a second. But, um, Let's go to the doctors who actually have experience with vaginal steaming and let's get their opinions on it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there is some scientific evidence about vaginal steaming. There actually have been some studies done. They just haven't been done in Western countries. They've been done in uh, China, India, Suriname, and Korea. Okay. And I also put those studies on the vaginal steam world map. They're fascinating. In China, they're using vaginal steaming. They have a study about using it to get rid of infections. Yes. In Korea, they have a study. They have several studies actually. Um, so there's probably about 11 studies that I found. Um, in Korea, the, the, study, the studies show that vaginal steaming gets rid of cervical cancer, that it gets rid of infertility, specifically um, with uh, blocked fallopian tubes. Right. Uh, that it gets rid of menstrual pain. So, anyways, there's studies that are yeah. that exist. But even when I showed those to like, <laughs> I showed those to doctors here and researchers, they're like, "Oh, this is the way that they do their studies is so different. Right. Those don't count." Again, Whoa, I know. They don't even count. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. <laughs> we um, know what that's about too. You know, I mean, yeah, the issues around that of if it's another country, especially if it's a different race of people that are doing it, you know, then it, it isn't as valid as here. Yeah. It's racism. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, I mean, it really is. Yep. If we're going to call it what it is, I mean, it's, it's pretty whack. <laughs> I think it's pretty whack. It is. Okay. It is. So that said, I actually, um, last year, uh, my company did a study. Okay. Ooh, cool. That's why it's a trial study because it was a very small group of um, people that were involved in the study. Um, and it was just a study to, so even with a study, like people can't do studies when they have no idea what vaginal steaming is doing or what you should look at. So what I want to do, um, so sorry, so what I did was I designed a study and we wanted to have 30 women. Um, and what I learned about doing studies, recruiting is difficult. Um, we were working with women postpartum. A lot more women ended up with cesareans than we expected. Wow. They were planning vaginal and so forth. So anyways, we ended up being able to do the study with 12 women. Okay. okay. And so, uh, or I mean, we did a lot more women, but that's what we got what all the results yeah. So what we did is I had, I hired a midwife. She did all of the vaginal steams. She was completely independent from me. I had no idea what she was doing. We weren't even in the same state. And what she did was she recruited people who were planning vaginal births. And so she, uh, one group of the women, six of the women, she did, um, she, she steamed with on day four, five, six, seven, uh, she, um, days four, five, six, seven, and eight postpartum. Okay. So she did five vaginal steams with this group. And then the other group, um, she didn't do any vaginal steams with. And what she did was she looked at these groups on day four. She did a full examination, looking at all these different indicators mm -hmm. uh, for postpartum recovery. And then she did another exam on day eight after the steaming was done for this group. And then she did another um, exam on them at six weeks. 
And so we took these indicators and we crunched them. I, I gave them to a, uh, somebody with a PhD who was able to crunch these numbers for us, make up the charts. And, you know, honestly, we don't know what the numbers say. Like when you're doing this, you know, you just collect right. it. Okay, what's her waist size? Okay, what's her this? Yeah, yeah. Wow. When the numbers were crunched, they really told the story, which there were six er areas. So this is called the fourth trimester vaginal steam study. There were six areas where the, this, the group who steamed was doing much better than the group that didn't steam. And the area that really stood out to me the most, because it wasn't something that I had ever thought about or talked about, was stitches. Oh. Three quarters of the women in the study ended up getting stitches. And the steam group had no problems and no discomfort with the stitches by day eight. All of them, so, sorry, on day four, everybody who had stitches had problems, the steam group, the non-steam group, right. pulling, itching, uh, discomfort, urinating, um, and so on, okay? Mm -hmm. By day eight, the steam group had zero discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, by day eight, the steam group, the non-steam group actually had a little bit more discomfort. Mm -hmm. And then at six weeks, the STEAM group continued to have zero discomfort and the non-STEAM group, all of them were still having issues. Wow. So, you know, like you look at something like that, well, that was a medical intervention, the stitches, right? And so even the STEAM, the ability for it to be able to clean the stitches so that they can heal so that the person doesn't have that discomfort. I mean, that waddle, that duck That's waddle. amazing. Because of stitches, That's yeah, right? Um, the non, the, oh, sorry, the STEAM group lost more weight they lost more weight, uh, more inches off of their waist. They um, expelled their lochia quicker. They, they no longer had, were expelling lochia. That's like the postpartum discharge. Right. Uh, by six weeks, the steam group still, uh, sorry, the non-steam group still had some lochia at that point. Um, you know, so anyways, there was a lot of indicators where the steamers were way better off than the non-steamers to the point that the midwife was like, I felt so bad not steaming. Yeah, the non-steam group. And so at the end of the study, after the six week exam, she steamed all of the non-steam group just so that they had the benefit of that. And she left and, and she um, educated them about steaming and recommended it for them. Wow, that's crazy. But that didn't mess with the data. It had to be after the six right, weeks. Right, right. So are you wanting to do more of these studies then? I mean, I, I, <laughs> I would love to design more I sorry I already have designed more and I would love to prove like do test trials I, I got involved with the uh, um, di different talks with different several universities that are interested in doing studies and doing studies is like such a huge thing and you need so much funding for it and they're they're, they want to do it, but they're also saying the funders aren't going to approve yeah. this. And so there's just so much involved. So I think there actually will be studies that I'll be involved with um, helping to design those. Maybe yeah, or because you're such a plethora of information. You need to be a part of these. <laughs> but I really liked doing this little trial study, you know, and of course I'm so when it comes to studies, this study would never count because right. I'm an interested person. I have a company on vaginal steaming. Right, so right. it would be like, oh, well, those results were whatever. But what it does is it gives other people an idea of what they can try because I already know what I've seen from the anecdotal evidence, from the stories. So then it's like, okay, so the same with fibroids. Let's take, let's take women. Well, so the fibroids, we don't even, we want to take somebody, we want to take women with fibroids and steam them for three months and see if yeah. the fibroids get, get smaller. I mean, yeah. we have, again, I'm hearing stories every day of people's fibroids shrinking as a result of steaming. And so that is so important just from, you know, a person that's had a fibroid and the situation off of that. But, you know, I mean, 80% of women, they say, you know, and um, up to 90% of African-American women will have a fibroid, right? By the time they're 50 and they are causing so much havoc, wreaking so much havoc mm -hmm. on women's lives and so many surgeries and really trying to figure out how to shrink them has been a, a tough thing, right? Even when you yeah. kind of get your diet in check and you get all the other things and your liver supported. And so I'm really excited about that aspect, you know, for, for women. Yeah. 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 And then you got women with bacterial vaginosis. Now, bacterial vaginosis is fun because when I talk to my doctor friends, they're like, yeah, we ugh, just yeah. get these women back every two weeks. But, uh, right? Yeah, it never goes away. Yeah, it just constantly comes back. Oh. <laughs> they themselves know how inefficient like yeah. their treatment yeah. method is for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, like these women are on probiotics all this time. That's not good for them, you know? I mean, it might be okay once when you need it, but like 
on rounds. You have some women that are just on rounds of probiotics and then, uh, and then the antivirals they have to take as a result of the yeast infection. That's yeah, not good. absolutely. So, um, so, and we don't really know the long-term effects of how that's affecting people. We don't know the long-term effects of most of this stuff, you know? Right. That's what we're learning um, through seeing all these recalls, mm -hmm. okay? Well, we thought that vaginal mesh would be a good way to treat prolapse, but now after it being in women for 10 years or 20 years, we're finding out that there's like, it's really messy with some women, you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. actually, you know, that, that was the first thing. And then it was like, okay, no more vaginal mesh in anybody because it's so bad, right? Like, you know, like it takes even, you know, the, the, it takes a while, you know, to get all the stories and then for, you know, the medical industry to realize that they shouldn't be doing something. Yeah. But ultimately we have to understand a lot of this stuff is experimental. Absolutely. You know? So much of it is. Oh my God, so, I could talk to you forever. There's so many, like, uh, uh, you're such a wealth of information. I really appreciate you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I know that's not necessarily the path that you had anticipated, as you mentioned, but like, it's so needed and necessary. And so I, you know, I know I really appreciate you doing this work. Do you train? Like, I'm like, I want to be trained on this. So do you train practitioners too? Yes. 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 So okay. I started with Steamy Chick mm -hmm. and I was selling the saunas. And what I noticed was that I was selling saunas and herbs, and I noticed that I was spending the most of my time educating people. I was on the phone, on email, and over text. I was educating people. They had so many questions. And so um, ultimately, and more people had started making saunas and herbs, and I had, so I, I actually stopped doing um, that, and I uh, started um, a certification program. So I trained uh, vaginal steam facilitators. Um, and then I also opened the Parasteam Hydrotherapy Institute, mm. uh, where I, you know, conduct the research and put together those studies and pull the information into one place. Um, and th the Parasteam Hydrotherapy Institute, um, I also, I, so is, is, so let's say my certifications, I consider under my Parasteam Hydrotherapy Institute, you know, so that's where um, the first level is a vaginal steam facilitator. And that's a really easy level. That's, you know, those weekly steam sessions with people mm -hmm. making sure that they're getting the right herbs that you can do an intake for, make sure they're not contraindicated and figure out the best setup for them. And that's a very basic level because a lot of people, when they're coming to me, you know, they have spas, they want to do steaming. They just want to make sure that they're getting it right and that they're certified. Right. So that's the first level. Then the second level of my certification is um, my parasteam hydrotherapist certification and this is where somebody actually learns how to read the menstrual cycles how to treat it uh, not treat how to steam uh, people how to see how to do steam um, plans when somebody has advanced issues such as fibroids ovarian cysts infertility issues infections and so forth so that's my parasteam hydrotherapist certification. And yeah, there's like, I mean, it, there's so much to it. You seem different in so many different situations. So it can be used for um, pregnancy loss. It can be used for uh, menopause. It can be used post-menopause. Um, it can be used for girls when they're first getting their periods. Yeah. And it should be used in, in, in these different situations. Yeah. So um, at first, I kind of just had one class, and I was just like, yeah, and apply it in all these situations, and it wasn't working well. The practitioners didn't really. So now I, I expanded the program, and when we talk about how to use steaming for fibroids, the first thing we do is we go and we look at the different kinds of fibroids, where they can show up, which one steam is going to be more more likely to help in a quicker way, uh, when to do and recommend the person to go do ultrasounds. So it's a pretty high level of, um, of attention that the practitioners are able to um, to put towards the specific issue and then a, a pretty high level of training that they that they're able to get um, and including we do a, an anatomy class that um, is really interesting because we go into not the anatomy not just the anatomy but how the vaginal steaming might be impacting the anatomy mm. and you would love this course on what we're looking at with the hormones mm. because what we're finding is like for example the the hormones line for example the vaginal canal and you hear over and over again, well, there's no way that vaginal steaming, oh, sorry, in these media articles, these right. uninformed media articles, there's no way vaginal steaming could affect the hormones. Well, if the hormones are lining the vaginal canal and the uterine lining, well, this, we know for sure the steam touches the vaginal canal. Yeah. So if that's going to you know, be touching the, the estrogen directly, which is going to then go into the hormone feedback loop, it's very likely that the steaming is affecting the hormones. Absolutely. So, 
and so like and and we actually explore um i think in that course we explore like four or five of the different hormones and how whether or not vaginal steaming might be impacting them again it's all just us thinking through it at this right. point right wow that's so cool yeah i mean everything that you've talked about today i'm like it's so it's such a good therapy for every woman as you mentioned but particularly um so many women dealing with hormonal imbalances you know i mean i don't really know one woman especially you know once she hits maybe her mid-30s but even younger than that that deal with so many things just based off of you know being on birth control for years based off of the xenoestrogens in our environment, liver issues, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then going into perimenopause and things get all wacky. So I really love, and this is, you know, why I wanted to have you on and talk to you about this. So that women that don't know about it and don't know, or if they knew about it, but they don't know how much it can help you. Um, you know, I really wanted them to understand that. And I'm definitely, I definitely want to do your training program. Like I'll tell you right now, like, absolutely. Um, okay. I'm, I'm in another, um, a functional lab testing program right now, but I'm like, as soon as I'm done with that. <laughs> Ooh, functional lab testing. I love yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So I, but you know, it's like it, it really having all the, the possible tools um, at our disposal. And I really do love, you know, being able to use testing so that we can see where things are, um, what's going on, you know, but then it's like, okay, here are, um, are ways that we can support your system based on um, what's going on. So Super cool. Thank you so much for doing this work. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I mean, you're, the, you're getting the word out there. Um, Steamy Chick has always grown specifically because people interview me on podcasts. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> right there with me. So it's, it's just uh, steamychick.com. Yeah. Steamychick.com. Okay. And people, if they want to contact you, they should just go through the, the website. That's the easiest way. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you're on Instagram too, because I follow you on Instagram and I love seeing, you know, some of the testimonials and stuff will show up on there and you can kind of see the real impact. And that's just at Steamy Chick. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. On Instagram at Steamy Chick. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. This was amazing and I'm really excited to, you know, get this out there so more people can hear about it. Yes, totally. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks so much for being with us today and I will see you next week.